of the effects of sin and the evils of sin, the first that Ibn Qayyim mentions, he says is Hurman al ilm is that a person be prevented from knowledge. That a person be prevented from knowledge because he says knowledge is a light that Allah Azza wa Jal casts into a person's heart. Many times we think knowledge is just memorizing a lot. If I read a lot of books and I memorize a lot of information, then that's what knowledge is. But knowledge is really a light that Allah Azza wa casts into the heart of his believing slaves that illuminates for them that which confuses other people. It is something that gives them insight at a time when people have no sight. Imam Malik, to this effect, when Imam al-Shafi'i came and approached Imam Malik, and Imam al-Shafi'i was much younger than Imam Malik. Imam Malik passed away in 179 and Imam al-Shafi'i passed away in 204. But nonetheless, Imam, Imam Malik notices the uncanny intelligence and the brilliance of this young man. And so he says to him, he says, I see that Allah has cast in your heart a light. So do not darken that light. Do not darken it with the darkness of sin. And so protecting the light that we have, that insight, that inner light that illuminates us, we have to guard our sins. We have to guard our sins. And hence also Imam Shafi'i, he codified in famous poetry, Imam Shafi'i was known as being someone who had photographic memory and he would memorize pages even as he would look at them. And so the story goes that he had been walking in the street and he happened to see a woman's ankle uncovered by the wind. Just happened to see and glance at an ankle. And then he noticed that his memory had gotten weak. And so now you understand why we can't memorize anything. We go outside and we forget a juz of the Quran as soon as we step outside. Imam al-Shafi'i sees an ankle and he, his, his, but also it shows you the sensitivity of the Imam that he recognizes just the slightest difference in his capacity. And so Imam al-Shafi'i complains to his teacher Waqi' and he says, he codified this in verse, he says, He said, I complained to Waqi' about how bad my memory was and he guided me to the leaving of sins. And he told me that this ilm is nur, nurullahi la yu'ta li'asi, and the light of Allah Azza is not given to a sinner. And so the first effect of sin is the loss of knowledge. That's number one. Number two, he says, and of it is that a person miss out on their risk, miss out of their provision. There's a beautiful hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ, he says, inna ruh al-Qudus nafatha fi ru'i. The Prophet ﷺ says that the Holy Spirit cast into my essence that no soul shall pass until it has completed its risk and its ajal. No, none of us will check out of this earth until we've completed two things. We've gotten all of the risk that's due to us. And risk is a more expansive term than simply money. It's not just how much money you're going to make. It's everything that Allah Azza wa will provide you and your ajal, your lifespan. You are going to get what was written for you. You're not going to miss out on any of it. So then what are you required to do? What is the prophetic instruction? The Prophet ﷺ says, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَأَجْمِلُوا فِي الطَّلَبِ He says, then have taqwa of Allah and seek all of that out beautifully. And do not let the delay of your risk make you seek it out in what Allah Azzawajal has prohibited. فَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ لَا يُنَالُ إِلَّا بِطَاعَتِهِ Because what is with Allah Azzawajal cannot be acquired except through His obedience. And so the second effect of sin is that a person be prevented from their risk. The third is a person has a distance that they then feel, a strangeness that they feel with Allah Azza wa Jal. They no longer are comforted by being in the presence of Allah Azza wa Jal. They don't feel that sweetness in their prayer anymore. They're committing sins and every time they commit sins, they feel more distant. They feel that they are uncomfortable. They're listening to the Quran and they can listen to music for hours and hours and hours on end and it is pleasure after pleasure. And then you turn on the Quran in the car and they're like, can we... Just talk for a second. Can we just have a conversation? They can't find the ability. It's like, it's like when a person is dragging their nails on a chalkboard. Some people cannot listen to the Quran. Well, what has distanced you from Allah Azza wa so much? There's a beautiful question that if you ever find yourself distant from Allah, then ask yourself the question, which one of you moved? Because we only go distant from Allah. If you take a step towards Allah, He takes multiple towards you. If you hasten to Allah, Allah races towards you. And so, a person of the effects of sin is that a person feels distance from Allah Azza wa Jal. And the fourth is that a person feels distance not from Allah Azza wa Jal only, but from the righteous. Sometimes I feel like the righteous 
are too righteous for my heart. So I avoid them like I avoid the devils in the dark. But those that sit all day without even a spark of taqwa are equally painful to an aching heart. So who can I befriend? In the end, it's a lonely paradox. At times, it's better to be alone hearing the ticking of the clock. But the sheep that travels alone is in danger of the fox. So we pray for safe passage, knowing of the danger in which we walk. That a person feels distant from the people and also that they notice that the people are distant from them. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he says, Beware that the hearts of the believers curse you, hate you, while you are unaware. The people said, well, how could that be? He said, He says, you commit that which Allah Azawajal has prohibited in seclusion. And so Allah Azawajal casts aversion towards you in the hearts of the believers. There are some people that you meet and everybody just loves them. You just love that person. You have no idea, right? Allah Azawajal has just written this qabul for that person in your heart. And that inshallah is an indication of that person's being loved by Allah Azawajal and loved by Jibreel and loved by the angels. And there are some people who you just, you just don't like them. And even though they talk beautifully, and even though they, they do all of these things, all of those check marks are there, you find that the people just aren't responding to you. Then one of the things, not necessarily the case, but one of the things that a person has to do is make sure that their relationship with Allah Azza wa is strong. That your number one audience is always Allah. Your number one, the, the one who you make sure that you are always pleasing is Allah Azza wa And also of the effects of sins, and this is number five, is that things become difficult for you. Because Allah Azza wa says that whoever fears Him, min amrihi yusra, that Allah Azza wa will make their affairs easy. And so if a person does not fear Allah Azza wa what is understood is that that person will not have their affairs facilitated. That that person will not have everything made easy for them. And so of the effects of sin is that you find doors closed where they should have been opened or where you would have hoped that they be opened. You know the Prophet Sallallahu tells us the story of the man in the hadith of Abu Hurairah where the Prophet ﷺ tells us of a man who had been traveling and he was أَشْحَثْ أَغْبَرْ يَمُدُّ يَدَيْهِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ يَا رَبْ يَا رَبْ This man was dusty and disheveled and broken and he was extending his hands towards the sky and he was saying يَا رَبْ يَا رَبْ Now this is a person whose dua should have been accepted. They are a traveler and their, their heart is broken. They are completely connected to Allah. They have no hope in anything else in that moment. They are dusty and they're disheveled and they're calling upon Allah by His attributes of being the facilitator and the maintainer and the Lord. But the Prophet ﷺ says, حرام. His food was haram. His drink was haram. His clothes were haram. Nourished by haram. فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابِ لَهُ How can this person's dua be accepted? Isn't that all of the effects of sins? And so, of the effects of sins is that Affairs become difficult for you. Also, number six is that al maasi tuhin al qalb wal badan. That maasi sins weaken a person's ability, their heart, and their bodies, their physical bodies. You know, a beautiful story is Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu with Fatima radiallahu anha. And Ali radiallahu anhu was telling Fatima that, you know, they were both, Fatima had been grinding barley until her, her hands had become calloused and Ali ibn Abi Talib had been carrying water until his, his back hurt him. And so he told them, they're having a conversation amongst themselves. And Ali radiallahu anhu says to Fatima, he says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had been given some servants. Go and ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for a servant. And we all know who Fatima radiallahu anha is to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa She's daddy's little girl. And he goes to, she goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would sit, stand up. And he would sit her where he was seated sallallahu alayhi wa And yet... Fatima is asking the Prophet ﷺ for a servant and he says to her, no, I'm not going to give you a servant and leave Ahlul Sufa. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to give you a resource even though you are my daughter that I cannot provide to every citizen of the Muslim state. And she goes back home and Ali radiallahu anhu continues and he says that the, they came, uh, the Prophet ﷺ entreated entrance, sought permission and he stood in between them as they were laying down and he felt the coldness of his feet. And then he said to them, shall I not tell you what is better for you than a servant that every night before you go to sleep that you say SubhanAllah 33 times, Alhamdulillah 33 times, Allahu Akbar 34 times, that is better for you than a servant. Well, what's the relationship between this and that? Their request and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's prescription. The ulama, they, extend, they extracted from that 
that the dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jalla strengthens the body. That the dhikr of Allah actually strengthens the body. And we have a brother in, uh, in New York. This brother is called Giant. And he for started a group called the Bartenders. Bartenders pull up bars, not the bars. But if you look them up on YouTube, you'll find that these guys, mashallah, are monsters. They do things that I thought I was the only one who could do, subhanAllah. But this brother is a, literally a giant, mashallah. And you know, he's an older brother, but he's just, he looks like he was carved out of a mountain, mashallah, tabarakallah. And he was, we took him out to the playground and he was showing all of the kids of the masjid all of these different pull-ups that he does. And he said to them, young brothers, you know how I can do all of these things? And they're all amazed at what he can do. He said, every time I go up, I say, Allahu Akbar. I say, Subhanallah. I say, Alhamdulillah. That's how I'm able to do all of these things. The remembrance of Allah strengthens the body. Sins weaken the body. And so the Ibn Al-Qayyim comments and he says, you know, when the Muslim Ummah expanded all of this expansion that they did, why did they expand like that? When you look at what they were able to do to Persia and Rome, it was because, not because of the strength of their ability or their resources, it was the strength of their hearts. They had heart. And their hearts were not weakened by their sins. And there's so much to be said about that. Umar ibn Khattab who wrote letters to his generals and he said that you are given support by Allah Azza wa Jal because of the fact that you don't sin and you're the army that you are opposing sins. If you become equal in your sins, then whoever has the better material is going to win. And so sins stop a person's uh, strength and they weaken the person's body and they weaken the person's heart. Also of the harm of sins is that of the weaknesses of sins is that it shortens a person's lifespan. It shortens a person's lifespan. Well, how does it shorten a person's lifespan? Ibn Qayyim mentions a number of different ways. He said some of the scholars, they said that it shortens a person's lifespan, meaning that it extracts the blessing from a person's life. And so you find that a person lives 70 or 80 years and they haven't accomplished anything. They haven't done anything. Nothing that they does has anything, any barakah that will make it extend or grow beyond it. None of their projects grow into fruition. Nothing that they do outlasts them. And you look at someone like Imam al-Nawi rahimullah who lived decades shorter than many people. He died in his late 30s or maybe early 40s. Nonetheless, this man was able in that short time to fill the world with knowledge. And a qabul was written for his work that... And by the way, I'll give you a secret of Imam al-Nawi. Something that I noticed. I don't know if it's public knowledge or anything, but I'll share with you something that I noticed about Imam al-Nawi because we're talking about sins. You'll find that at the end of all of his books, the last chapter and the last hadith will always be about istighfar. It's just beautiful. The last hadith in the 40 hadith is the hadith of Anis ibn Malik. Ya ibadi. Where he says, Ya ibn Adam, inna kama da'awtani wa rajawtani ghafartu laka ala ma kana minka wa la ubali. You'll find that the last chapter in Riyadh al-Salihin is istighfar. You'll find that in his book al-Adhkar, the last chapter is istighfar. As if he is offering what he is offering to Allah Azza wa Jal and he is seeking Allah's forgiveness for whatever shortcomings are going to be in this effort that he provides. And so seeking forgiveness and removing the ill effects of sins that takes the, the barakah out of a person's life. But also it could actually shorten uh, a person's life from the extent or to the uh, extent that a person is considered to be alive in their moments with Allah Azza wa That is the moment where you are alive. And your moments of heedlessness are not truly life. You are not really living. And so the more a person is heedless, the shorter that person's life is. And the more they are remembering Allah Azza wa that is what is true life. Also, of the effects of sins is that sins lead to one another. Sins lead to one another. Al-dhunub laha akhawat. They say that sins have sisters. Okay, that doesn't work. Uh, sins follow one another. So sins have sisters. And you'll find that one of the sins that is most commonly paired with every other sin with every other sin is the sin of what? Lying. Lying. Why is lying the sin that comes with everything? Because it's the cloak of every other sin. And so the Prophet Sallallahu when he wants to rectify a person, he says to them, he says, وَإِيَّاكُمْ kadib Be aware of lying. Because lying leads to fujur. And fujur leads to the hellfire. Uh, so if you want to correct anybody's actions, then tell them to follow truthfulness. And truthfulness will lead to righteousness. And righteousness will lead to paradise. And tell them to avoid lying. And lying leads to transgression. And transgression leads to all evil. And it leads to the hellfire. And so, Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. When he committed one sin, which is he stayed away from the campaign of Tabuk. That's a sin. He stayed away from it. Ka'b ibn Malik, because of the pressure that came with that sin. 
entertained another sin that I do not believe he ever entertained in his entire life. Not only did he never entertain that sin, you and I would have never entertained that sin. We do not imagine that any one of us, if we are practicing Muslims, we lived our entire lives loving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa you cannot imagine yourself ever entertaining the notion of walking up to the Prophet ﷺ and lying to his face. But Ka'ab ibn Malik began to entertain that idea. When did he begin to entertain that idea? When he realized that he had missed the entire campaign and the Prophet ﷺ was now turning back, returning to Medina and he was going to have to stand in front of him and answer to why he did not go out. And he said, I began to think about what I was going to say. And I was thinking about what excuse I could propose to the Prophet ﷺ. And right before the Prophet ﷺ arrived, all of those ideas vanished from my mind because Allah Azza wa Jal gave him thabat because Allah Azza wa Jal recognized or knew his truthfulness from before. He was not one of the munafiqeen. He was someone who is sincere. And so Allah Azza wa Jal gave him steadfastness in his moments of self-doubt or in his moments of crises. But the point here is that sins lead to one another. Do never, never think that you will just commit one sin and you will be okay after that. It doesn't work like that. And I guess I'll conclude inshallah ta'ala and I'll conclude with the last one. And that is that sins are a source of insignificance in the sight of Allah Azza wa Abu Darda, when the Muslims conquered Cyprus and it was a day of great victory, the Muslims saw Abu Darda crying. And so they asked him, they said, why are you crying on a day when Allah Azza wa Jal has given victory to the Muslims? And Abu Darda said, how insignificant is the creation in the sight of Allah if they disobey His command. He's looking at this community, this country, this land, this, these people, how powerful they were. And he, here they were being conquered by the Muslims because of their disobedience to Allah Azza wa Al-Hasan al-Basri would weep and weep and weep and they would ask him and they would say, why are you weeping? And he would say, I am weeping because I fear that Allah Azza wa will cast me into the hellfire and he will not mind. A person who commits sins, when you commit sins, be fearful that these sins may lead you to be someone who Allah Azza wa Jal casts into the hellfire and you do not mind. Or that Allah Azza wa Jal will not mind. And of the most beautiful things, and I promise I close with this, that I have heard with regards to getting over and, and, and stopping sins. And I'm just going to give you one takeaway. Because one of the mean and real problems that we have is we just love the sin. When you're talking to a kid in high school and you're telling them to, to stop dating girls or you're telling a girl to stop dating boys and they just love it. That's the problem. You love going out to party or a person loves the lifestyle that they live. Or, and so even though they may repent from other things, they won't repent from that particular sin because they love it. And one of my teachers, he said that once he was going to Hajj and one of the people in his musallah, he said to him, Shaykh, make dua for me that Allah Azza wa rectifies all my sins. And he said, said inshallah. And then as he was leaving, he said, Shaykh, except for one. And he said, the Shaykh said, he was joking, but I felt that he was serious. And he said, he was commenting to me about this. He said, do you know something that you should say if you feel that you have a sin that you love? Say, Allahumma habib ilayna al-iman wa zayinhu fi qulubina wa karrih ilayna al-kufra wa al-fusuqa wa al-isyan. Make that your daily devotional that you say all of the time. Oh Allah, Make Iman beloved to us and beautify it in our hearts and make hated for me kuf, disbelief and fusuq, transgression and disobedience.